Yo, welcome back to part 2 of Bowser and the Great. Let's just get back into it. Okay, so after breaking camp at Issus, Alexander headed south to the Lebanon coast. Arriving at the Phoenician town of Marathus, the king there was gone and left his son in charge. So the son quickly surrendered to Alexander, giving him a place to rest, thankfully. There at Marathus, two Alexander giving him a place to rest, thankfully. There at Marathus, two envoys from Darius arrived with a letter from the great king. The contents of the letter varied by historians, but essentially it was Darius trying to make a deal with Alexander. He offered to Alexander that if he were to withdraw back home, he could keep all the territory of Asia Minor from the Aegean to the Halys River near Gordium. On top, he'd pay a kingly ransom for the return of his family. All Alexander had to do was stop his invasion of Darius's realm. It also was interpreted within the letter that if Alexander rejected, then Darius would unleash hell upon him and destroy the whole army. That letter was pretty bad news for Alexander. He knew Parmenian and pretty much every other obstacle a million times over. But Alexander dreamed of marching through the Nile, probably sipping my ties in Babylon, and taking showers with Golden Persepolis. So what he did next was a time-tested move, arguably one of the best tools a skilled politician and leader can do. He lied. Alexander composed a forgery of Darius's letter, but Alexander composed a forgery of Darius's letter, but put it full of outrageous and obscure demands things that no Macedonian would ever consider. So when he presented those terms of this forgery to the council, they took the bait and angrily rejected the great king's terms. And with that outright no received from his officers, Alexander composed his own letter to Darius. He started the letter by admitting his title of king, blamed Darius for the war that his ancestors started. Alexander called himself Lord of Asia, and said that he would only return Darius's family if he came before him as a suppliant and finally warned Darius to surrender quick, or that he, Alexander, would pursue him to the ends of the earth. Ends of the earth. And now it was time to move on from Marathus. Two days of marching along the coast brought Alexander to the Phoenician trading center of Byblos, followed by Bertius, present-day Beirut, then the famous port of Sidon, where they actually despised the Persians for sacking the city a few years prior, and continuing south on the Lebanese coast, coast was Tyre, the most powerful and important of all Phoenician cities. They were an ancient rival of Sidon and a super rich trading center. The main part of the city was actually located on an island offshore and surrounded by walls more than 100 feet high. Practically untouchable by any invading army. Pretty much made Fort Knox look like a gingerbread by some amiable Tyrian envoys welcoming him to their city and gave his army provisions and even a golden crown of submission. Not a bad start, to be honest. Although their king was indisposed in the Aegean, they told Alexander he would have been happy to welcome Macedonians if he was here. But despite those warm greetings, they told Alexander he could not enter the city. When Alexander, but despite those warm greetings, they told Alexander he could not enter the city. When Alexander asked if he could make a sacrifice to Hercules in their temple of Melkart, who was this Phoenician equivalent of Hercules, they said what he could do is go to a nice temple on the mainland opposite of their city. At this point, both sides knew they weren't discussing a simple sacrifice. The Tyrian composed a garrison, and Alexander knew they were just giving him gifts to buy time in case the naval offense in the Aegean would force him to go back west. So what happened next is what you'd expect. Alexander blows a gasket as he didn't handle rejection well. He fumed and vented his anger onto the Tyrians. He would show them what happens when you deny Alexander the Great what he wants. So now they're starting with a building of a causeway. And that's sort of like this raised road or bridge, and it would go all the way out to the island. So week after week, Alexander built upon it, got closer and closer, he'd lose some progress, and so forth. Um, and eventually, the Phoenician kings of Sidon and Marathus sailed home from the Aegean and wanted to give Grant him 80 plus triremes and a good deal of crew. Then with the usual stroke of good luck, more towns sent him more ships and more men. And now Alexander had a chance, and he moved quickly. He moved to Sidon, where 4,000 Greek mercs, some fresh recruits, awaited. The king packed up everyone on ships and set off to Tyre for some naval warfare action. The king packed up everyone on ships and set off to Tyre for some naval warfare action. But to be honest, not a whole lot happened. Week after week, there was just this mixture of assault and defense with no major headway for either side. And by this point, it had already been one year since the Battle of Issus and almost seven months trying to take Tyre and was determined to finish this thing for good. Finally, an armored ship with a battering ram managed to break a hole in the wall, and quickly following, he sent man after man as they breached through, pouring into Tyr. At last, Alexander would get what he wanted. So once truly inside the city, the slaughter was insane. 
Everybody was pissed, Alexander included, that they had been slaving away for seven months trying to take this city. So Alexander did not hold his men back when they slaughtered every man, woman, and child. Thousands died within just the first few hours. Some flee to the shrine dedicated to the city founder, and Alexander himself led the charge on there. The founder, and Alexander himself led the charge on there and killed everybody. Um, sooner or later, the bloodlust sort of settled, and the Macedonians rounded up the remainder of the citizens to be sold into slavery. Some 30,000 people. But 2,000 men of fighting age that were captured were taken to the mainland beach across from the city. It was Alexander's. Now he could do what he wanted. Go pay respects and make a long-delayed sacrifice at the temple dedicated to Hercules, or Melkart, the Phoenician version. Gladly leaving the smoky ruins of Tyr and the filled causeway in the dust, the Macedonians left to continue their march down the Mediterranean coast. Moving south, showering him with gratitude and such. More Persians came with peace offerings from Darius, now telling Alexander he could marry Darius' daughter, get a ton of gold, and keep all the lands west of the Euphrates. But really this was just sent because building up his Persian army was taking longer than usual and he needed at least another year of stalling. This letter Alexander received, received, he ended up not forging and just read it to his council, including Parmenian. Everyone shot their opinions and the last of theirs was of course Parmenian. He told Alexander that if he were him, he would accept the terms of Darius. In Alexander fashion, he shot back at Parmenian, saying that he too would accept them. If he, fashion, he shot back at Parmenian, saying that he too would accept them, if he were Parmenian. So Alexander writes back to Darius and tells him that he needs no money, will marry Darius's daughter whenever he wants to, and the lands he could keep were nothing compared to the entire empire he was about to conquer. Nothing compared to the entire empire he was about to conquer. And with the sending of that letter, Alexander was off again and the journey continued to Egypt with only one obstacle remaining along the way. The fortress town of Gaza on the coastal plain at the edge of the Negev desert. The Persian governor there was a eunuch by the name of Batis. He took the city, he practically dared him to even try. But the guy's confidence wasn't all talk. The city sat far above the plain with great walls. So Alexander's engineers decided to build a mound surrounding the city that equaled its height. Then he placed towers on it and stormed the city. So, like in Tyr, the building began. The building began. Meanwhile, one morning, a swarm of Arab mercenaries started a little battle and Alexander rushed to join in. Almost immediately, he got hit by an arrow fired from a catapult that pierced his shield and went straight through his army and into his shoulder. Dude was pissed. He ordered the wound to be dressed and legit just cast and legit just kept on fighting. That is until he fell into unconsciousness from the loss of blood. I'm sure at that point, the city and Batis probably thought they killed Alexander, but no, Alexander was not dead, but he was in fact very, very angry. Um, soon enough, arriving by ship, the previous siege towers from Tyr were launching three different assaults, they were all pushed back, then despite his aerial injury, Alexander led the fourth one and they breached the city walls. And although the people of Gaza fought pretty bravely, they stood no chance against the fury of a Macedonian. All the men in the city died at their posts, but women and children were captured for slavery. The bowed down or risked cruel punishment. Batis merely gazed in utter contempt at Alexander. And what happens next is so messed up that most ancient historians admit it entirely, but I like messed up stuff, so here it is. Remember the movie Troy, or I guess in the Iliad, when Achilles took the body of Hector, who he just killed and dragged his body behind him in a chariot, who he just killed and dragged his body behind him in a chariot? Well, this is a little worse. So Alexander took Batis, still completely alive, put him on the back of his chariot and drug him through the rocky desert around the city of Gaza until long after he was dead. Yeah, and then he just simply carried on. He put Gaza on. He put Gaza under Macedonian control, sent his fleet ahead, and advanced with his army to the coastal deserts of the northern Sinai. And now, at last, Alexander could be on his way to Egypt. Now at this point, it has been a whole two years since the Macedonians crossed into Asia, and Alexander is in Pelusium on the eastern extreme of the Nile Delta, the Persian ruler of Egypt. Smartly, he surrendered the entire province to Alexander, and to make sure he'd be shown mercy, he brought the entire treasury with him. And boom, in one day, Alexander added a province larger and crazy richer than all of Greece to his growing empire.
But although they did surrender to him, he still knew that growing empire. But although they did surrender to him, he still knew that to truly possess the land required some skilled diplomacy and good propaganda. Luckily, Alexander excelled at both of those. So over the next few months, he went on a political campaign tour of sorts. He traveled along the Nile greeting people, showed the Egyptians that he was, and visited the cities Heliopolis and Memphis, the religious capital. It was there at Memphis that Alexander went to Temple Ta and offered copious sacrifices to the god, which was a deliberate contrast to Cambyses of Persia the century before, who killed their sacred Apis bull. Obviously, the priests were super thrilled, and although ancient sources don't confirm it, after Memphis, historians argue about where he went next. Was it north toward the Mediterranean or south to see more ancient temples and palaces? Honestly, it doesn't matter, but it's easy to believe he went sightseeing. Like, even the ancient pyramids were as old to Alexander as he is to us, so he was probably starstruck and fascinated. Regardless, though, by January, he split into different channels. He made his way to a small trading post called Nacratis. Alexander desired this to be a booming new trade center in the Mediterranean, and as quick as he always is, he laid out plans to build a settlement into what he envisioned, and that new settlement would later come to be known as Alexandria. With his new city of Alexandria founded, he felt that as Alexandria. With his new city of Alexandria founded, he felt this sudden urge and powerful desire to visit the distant oasis oracle at Siwa. 300 miles west of the Nile Valley in the middle of the Sahara, it was said that Hercules had visited, so Alexander of course had to retrace his ancestors' footsteps. Despite the source, Alexander spent several precious weeks in the middle of a war to risk his life crossing one of the most inhospitable deserts in the world just to hear the words of a god from some oracle. And it seems pretty crazy to do that, but... I guess those were different times full of mystery and magic, so it was probably not too crazy to do in the middle of a war. Nevertheless, Alexander made the trek dying of thirst along the way. But they managed to make it, and Alexander immediately rushed to the Oracle of Amon. Climbing into the rocky citadel and walking boldly into the sanctuary, the high priest was waiting for him there. The priest apparently knew some Greek with a rough accent, and greeted Alexander with Opadon, trying to mean my child, but act which meant O child of Zeus. Alexander the Humble probably didn't mind that. He was already thinking his dad might be Zeus and not Philip, so he surely thought that was probably a sign in and of itself. So what happens next is a complete mystery though. Only Alexander and the priest were in there, so we can only guess what went down. But with some certainty we can say that the experience did change Alexander what went down. But with some certainty we can say that the experience did change Alexander. Because it's after that visit that he would sort of begin to become himself son of the god Zeus, and even strike coins with the image of himself with ram's horns, a mark of a deity. And now, for the rest of the time in Egypt, Alexander held some festivities of a deity. And now, for the rest of the time in Egypt, Alexander held some festivities, met with envoys from the Aegean, and dealt with some governing and military affairs. Very similar to what he did in Sardis and Lydia, by splitting power among men, he did that as well in Egypt put some Egyptians as leaders, a couple Macedonians in charge of the remaining, tro the remaining troops, officer for the navy, and so forth. Now, in the spring, it was time to head toward Mesopotamia. Marching from Egypt, Alexander's men first went back to Phoenicia, and along the way got news that the man he appointed governor of the small province of Samaria was killed. The Samaritans had taken him, tied him to a state dependent as Alexander was in hurry to get to Mesopotamia and brawl with Darius, but they were pretty wrong. Alexander immediately set off in the hills of Samaria with his best troops to punish those who dare kill his appointed governor. When he got to their city, he destroyed it and established a Macedonian colony. Of the Samaritans there, they told Alexander where the nobles went who married his governor and hunted them down. Trucking them at night to a cave on a hillside, Alexander ordered torches to be lit at once. And without any thought for the women and children or separating good from bad, he led his troops into the cavern and slaughtered every living soul. And actually, the skeletons of those people wouldn't even be found by archaeologists until more than 2,000 years after. Found by archaeologists until more than 2,000 years after. This is just another instance to show that any words or actions against the will of Alexander do not go unnoticed or unpunished. So, after this little fiasco, Alexander went to Tyre again, found a replacement for the governor of Samaria, made some other appointments, held festivities and plays, and more or less took a quick, took a quick break. And once he and the men were rested and ready to go, they began their trek to Babylon. The direct path was around 500 miles, but nearly impossible to make because it crossed the deserts of Arabia, 
So, Alexander followed the routes that kings and patriarchs used throughout history, which was almost twice as far as the straight path. Weeks of marching, the Macedonians reached the town, Thapsacus, on the Euphrates at the beginning of August. It was probably hot enough to make Arizonans feel right at home. At Thapsacus, Alexander put his engineering corps to work on a building a pontoon bridge to cross the river. Soon enough it was ready, and Alexander on the bridge looked beyond the Euphrates and could see several thousand Persian horsemen just looked beyond the Euphrates and could see several thousand Persian horsemen just watching him. Among the Persians were the typical Greek mercs and the satrap of Babylon, Mosaeus. The satrap was given strict orders by Darius to scout, report back, and burn any crops south along the river, as that was the expected path for Alexander to take. But you think by now that Darius did so he, of course, crosses and heads northeast toward the Tigris and the old Assyrian capital of Nineveh. Mosaeus, the satrap, rides off to tell Darius what's going on, which pisses Darius off because he spent the last two years preparing to face Alexander on the plains he was prepared for. So while Alexander was marching across northern Mesopotamia, but rather than that, Darius was actually super prepared. He had learned his lessons from the past battles and was ready. He knew not to fight out near plains, increased the number of his troops, of which he took from all places under his empire, which had made for this really scary melting pot of fighters, and he was prepared to adapt. All that was left for Darius was to finish off the Macedonian king once and for all, or so he hoped. By mid-September, the Macedonians, some 50,000, less than half of what Darius had, arrived at the Tigris. Without preparing a bridge of sorts, the men crossed the river linking arms and made camp on the far bank of the Tigris. Soon after, on the night of September 20th, think of the Tigris. Soon after, on the night of September 20th, 331, something happened that the Macedonians would long remember. The men, finishing their evening meal under a clear desert sky, noticed that the moon was slowly becoming darker, and not before long the entire lunar face was covered by the color of blood. It was just a lunar eclipse right before the eve of such a major battle. But again, you gotta remember that this is sort of a mystical and borderline superstitious time period. But that was a serious omen that caused the army too much panic and not enough disco. But to an educated man like Alexander, however, he knew the science behind the eclipse and wasn't freaked out. But most behind the eclipse and wasn't freaked out. But most soldiers just saw it as the movements of heavenly bodies that were just a divine mystery. So, something to be anxious of for sure. The whole army panicking began to shout, and Alexander hearing this, marched to the center of camp with his trusty old seer, Aristander. The wise seer proceeded to, tell them, proceeded to tell the men that it was a sign from the gods, but one favorable. The darkened moon was a symbol of the Persians, who that very month would be eclipsed by the army of Alexander in battle. Serious props to Aristander thus, actually pretty clever. Anyways, that made the men cheer, and made them confident in all that good sun, moon, and earth as a thanksgiving for the divine sign of victory, which then just bolstered the cheering and all that stuff. And with that behind them, the next day, the army continued their march south across the plains with the mountains of Armenia on the right and the Tigris on the left. No sign of Persians until the fourth day after crossing the river in which some a thousand Persian horsemen in the distance. Alexander then ordered several squads of his own cavalry to follow in pursuit of the Persian riders. As soon as Alexander and his men came over the hill in pursuit, the Persians started galloping away, but Alexander caught up with them and began to cut them down, keeping a few alive for questioning. From those captured, he learned that Darius questioning. From those captured, he learned that Darius and his men were close by. They were camped on a broad plain called Gagamela. Unlike on the narrow plains of Issus, this plane would provide plenty of space for Darius to use his numerical advantage. Darius had even spent several days leveling out dips and rises on the plain to promote a Darius had even spent several days leveling out dips and rises on the plain to promote a smooth surface for cavalry and chariots. He was taking zero chances with Alexander. Now, with Alexander knowing the location of Darius, he ordered his army to leave everything behind except weapons and prepare to move out by night. As dawn approached, the men except weapons and prepared to move out by night. As dawn approached, the Macedonians came over the last hill separating themselves from the Persians by just three miles. They gazed down onto the plains of Gagamela. At least 100,000 Persians were encamped below, an insane number of men. Even Alexander was worried. Quickly, he called the council together for advice. With an element of surprise, should he wait? He wasn't sure. Parmenian urged him to delay and survey the field. Best to get a lay of the land before battle, 
and for once Alexander agreed with Parmenian and ordered his men to drop camp in battle order. Next, the king took a squad down to the plain to inspect the soon-to-be battlefield, and there's their orders. There was no time for elaborate speeches or go-try-your-best type of encouragement. It was pure and to the point. Tomorrow they were not going to be fighting for Tyre or for Egypt, but for the sovereignty of all of Asia. And outnumbered as they were, with order and discipline remaining supreme, and if no mistakes were made, made victory would be theirs. So dismissing his generals and ordering the army to rest, he retired to his own tent for the night. Parmenian, though, came into his tent for a private talk. He asked Alexander if an eye attack might actually be the best bet. Alexander shot back that he did not steal his victories and Parmenian left. But that old drag not steal his victories and Parmenian left. But that old drag Parmenian did give Alexander an idea. Sources say that Darius was actually expecting an eye attack from Alexander. So Alexander cleverly spread false word that he would actually attack that night. And with the ever-present network of Persian spies, they would have surely earned forces army to stay awake all night just at the chance of a night attack. But nothing happened other than making the Persians exhausted while the Macedonians slept the night away getting adequate rest for the battle ahead. And as sunrise approached, Alexander's officers came into his tent and were shocked to see him sleeping for all the men to go at breakfast. After some time passed, Parmenian went into Alexander's tent, calling for him loudly until the king opened his eyes. The old whippersnapper asked Alexander how he could sleep so soundly with such a great battle ahead. Smiling ever slightly, Alexander told Parmenian, Why don't you know we've already won? But with no more time to waste, he sprang up, ate a quick meal, donned his super dope armor, and strode out of his tent to the church of his troops. With the seer air stander standing beside him, he offered sacrifice before the army, called his officers together to reveal them the plan that he had just devised the prior night. With his plans now told to his officers, he took a long gaze upon the Persian army. Long gaze upon the Persian army. He saw two broad lines, with cavalry in the front and infantry behind. He saw the legendary Bactrian horsemen facing his right along with other Central Asian riders. Cavalry units from many nations formed the long center of the front line, along with scythe chariots, thousands of archers, and the elephants the Indians had a solid wall of cavalry, behind them the infantry. Darius himself was across the Macedonian right, surrounded by his loyal Persians and Greek mercs. For our Macedonians, we have Parmenian commanding the left and Alexander the right. Alexander stationed the Thessalian horsemen with Parmenian, but kept a decent-sized amount for himself. Also, there was a second line of a decent-sized amount for himself. Also, there was a second line of infantry, mostly his own Greek mercs, behind the center in case the Persians broke through. This battle would have to go just perfect for Alexander to win, that of which he of course planned on doing. So like in past fights, Alexander intended to strike first with the right side of his line and draw the enemy away to open up space to drive right into their heart. But with so many Persian soldiers stretching beyond both of his lines, he had to try something new, something no general in history had ever done. Alexander, atop Bucephalus, set out with his cavalry force on the right side of the line, not toward the Persians, but parallel to their forces, riding farther and farther to the right, without ever coming into contact with Sane, because it looked as if he was trying to encircle Darius's entire army. But nah. Alexander, however daring and slightly insane, still had a plan. If he could draw enough of the Persians away from their center and after him, he might create a gap in their lines. At that moment, he'd then wheel around and dash back to that gap before the Persian troops pursuing him could fall like a bad plan, like slim chances it would work. But a bad plan is better than no plan. Anyways, as Alexander and his cavalry are striding to the right, Darius saw this and sent Bessus and his cavalry after him. Nearing the edge of the field, the Persians pulled ahead of Alexander and began to move around him on his right. In response, Alexander ordered his Greek man to move around him on his right. In response, Alexander ordered his Greek mercs and the Paeonian cavalry under Ariston to attack Bessus and his men to keep them engaged on the far side of the battlefield. Meanwhile, Darius launched the main body of his forces against the Macedonian left, hoping to use their scythe chariots to literally tear through them and create confusion, thus opening a hole. But Mr. the Great King did not know Alexander had been drilling his men on how to deal with these things. When the chariots approached them, the Thracians in the front lines launched deadly volleys of javelins at the driver, killing many while they were still charging. Others simply snatched the reins as the chariots drove past and pulled the drivers down. The rest that got by were simply stepped by the army to let them through, then closed their lines behind them. Quick fix to that problem, but only the first of many. 
because already the Persian cavalry were striking the Macedonians, followed by the infantry. The Macedonian left was holding, but was coming awfully close to breaking. Back to Alexander. At last he saw what he was waiting for, a thing. Back to Alexander. At last he saw what he was waiting for, a thinning in the Persian center. He ordered his men to turn sharply back and charge the opening in wedge formation. In a loud battle cry, he and his men raced toward the great king and his men. Surprised, I am sure, Darius suddenly saw Alexander and his men fight their way through swords and spears to him. Darius suddenly saw Alexander and his men fight their way through swords and spears to him. But once Alexander drew too close, the great king ordered his charioteer to turn and flee. In the same moment, Alexander received word that Parmenia and his men were in danger. The Persians under Mazaeus broke through their lines, tearing their way up to the Macedonian baggage train in the rear, even if it helped kill the Macedonians. Essentially, the Macedonians were getting slaughtered. So Alexander had to make a call. Would he chase Darius to capture him and deal a solid blow to the Persians, but lose half his army in doing so? Alexander couldn't do it. He turned his men around and rushed to aid Parmenian, eventually surrounding the Persians and cutting all of them down. As the dust settled, the Macedonians arose as apparent victors in one of the greatest battles in history. The Persians had lost tens of thousands of men, tons of riches, and even left a few elephants for Alexander. The Macedonian losses, however, fared comparatively lightly. But more important to Alexander was not the but more important to Alexander was not the small picture details of the battle, but what he achieved in large. Glory. He risked everything and won, defeating in open battle the largest Persian army ever assembled. Even though he didn't kill or capture Darius, the great king was now most surely weakened ruler in a continually the road to Babylon was now open, with the wealth of Susa and Persepolis up for grabs. The fight was not yet over, but the awesome royal glory forward was all for Alexander's taking. After the win at Gagamela was in the bag, Alexander and the Macedonians headed off on the journey to the famed city of Babylon. The road to Babylon took the Macedonians over to agriculture. They trekked on past ancient cities where writing had been invented and men charted stars. Marching south on the Tigris, past Asher and Takri, out of the highlands of Assyria, into the land of Babylonia. Here in southern Mesopotamia, the rivers were only a few miles apart, so it was easy for Alexander to cross from the banks of the Tigris west of the Euphrates. The Euphrates. Crossing, the Macedonians saw a procession approaching from the north. It was Mazaeus, the satrap of Babylon who previously just fought against the Macedonians, bringing with him totes fab gifts for Alexander. Reaching him safely, probably because they had already been in talks of surrender, he and his grown sons prostrated themselves before Alexander. Grown sons prostrated themselves before Alexander. Mazaeus, a practical guy, wanted to be on the winning side. Wisely, he surrendered Babylon to Alexander, showering him with gifts from the richest city in the world. All he wanted was to remain in his role as governor of Babylon. Seeing that Alexander agreed to that is a pretty big version in charge, as opposed to his previous handlings in places like Sardis and Egypt. Alexander, of course, still would put Macedonians as military unit commanders, but nonetheless, Mosaeus had real authority. A true change of policy, and a skilled political move. Alexander granting Mosaeus this sent a signal to those Mosaeus this sent a signal to those once ruled by Darius that the new king around these parts, Alexander, was merciful and reasonable. If they joined him willingly, they would be rewarded. Alexander, with the city's surrender, could now head straight into the city of Babylon. It was an enormous city, more than two thousand years old. Herodotus claimed the city was shaped like a square. Its sides more than 13 miles each, giving its walls a circumference greater than 50 miles. A deep moat formed its outer boundary next to the wall itself, reportedly being 70 feet wide and 300 feet high. On top of the entire perimeter of the wall was a road wide enough for a four-horse chariot to be driven, but no entrance was cooler than the Ishtar Gate. Made up of one hundreds of glazed blue tiles decorated with golden bowls and dragons, all surrounded by bands and rosettes. The city itself was divided in half by the Euphrates, but there was a bridge connecting the two. The whole city was in fact laid out in grid formation. Inside the houses were threaded about selling stuff from Chinese silk to Baltic amber. Can't forget about the royal palace, the central ziggurat, and temples, especially the one dedicated to Bel Marduk, the chief god of Babylon. HGTV talk aside, it was on a bright autumn day when Alexander entered the city through the Ishtar Gate at the head of his troops. Thousands were to enter the city through the Ishtar Gate at the head of his troops.
Thousands were awaiting him. They threw flowers and garlands onto the troops, showered them with perfume, and followed it all with gifts and songs. To the men born from poor villages in Macedonia, this must have been another world. Inside the city, the first stop of Alexander was to the temple Belmarduk, where he sacrificed to the chief god, which granted him cheer from the natives. After he retired to the palace with his officers and settled into a life of luxury living for the next month. In that month, Alexander would go on to visit temples, gaze upon the hanging gardens of Babylon, converse with ancient priest philosophers, the Chaldeans, and so though, but actually out of genuine curiosity. But Alexander couldn't spend all his time in Babylon. Amnitis, a veteran commander, had arrived from Macedonia with 15,000 new recruits ready for battle. New appointments had to be made, military affairs arranged, and so on. So before leaving the city, Alexander appointed Agathon as him. The overall command of military affairs went to Apollodorus, along with 2,000 soldiers and money to hire more. Asclepiodorus was put in charge of the Osophon duty of taxes, and Mazaeus was still reconfirmed as satrap. In addition, to keep his army happy, and probably more so to lure them away from Babylon, he gave each of happy, and probably more so to lure them away from Babylon, he gave each of his Macedonian cavalry a year's pay as a bonus. Even foreign horsemen got a bonus, and infantrymen got at least six months of pay as a bonus. So after dragging the last of his men out of the brothels, no doubt, Alexander set out with his newly enlarged army to the winter last of his men out of the brothels, no doubt. Alexander set out with his newly enlarged army to the winter capital of the Persian Empire at Susa. Darius was still at large, but more important to Alexander was securing the treasuries at Susa and Persepolis. Susa, being the closer city, would be his first stop. More than 100 miles down the royal road, the Macedonians made their journey. The Macedonians made their journey. First, it took them to the endless marshes where the mouths of the Tigris and Euphrates met the Persian Gulf, a land known in antiquity as Sumer. The Sumerians had lived and built cities over 3,000 years before Alexander and as one of the oldest civilizations on earth. Marching through these lands, the Chaldeans that Alexander brought with him surely would have told him stored older legends. After marching for 20 days, the army arrived at Susa. Alexander, guided in by the satrap's son, was then met by Abulites, the satrap himself. With a formal surrender, he bestowed upon Alexander regal gifts and a ridiculous amount of money. 40,000 talents of gold and silver bullion, enough mula of money. 40,000 talents of gold and silver bullion, enough mula to fund the Macedonians and the whole empire for many years to come. Receiving the gifts with joy, Alexander made his way to the citadel and entered the royal residence hall, no doubt staring in awe at decorations, architecture, and all the tr In there he saw the great king's royal throne, which was a death for anyone to sit in but Darius. So, Alexander went on and plopped down on it, making a very public show on who the boss is now. But unlike in Babylon, he didn't stay for that long. Winter was settling on the Zagros Mountains and he was ready to be off. He left behind hands. Alexander knew that everywhere he had conquered so far, he had been seen as a liberator, freeing conquered people groups from Persians. But from now on out, he was headed to the heart of the Persian Empire. He would now be a true invader in hostile territory. The Persians were sure to fight much harder for their homeland than they were elsewhere. Then Indians, some of the best warriors in the world, would fight equally as hard for their homes. The battle so far may have been won, but the hardest parts were yet to come. Leaving Susa in the warm plains of Mesopotamia, Alexander and his army entered the snow-covered mountains of Persia. These highlands were occupied by people called the Uxians, and their leader. These highlands were occupied by people called the Uxians, and their leader Madatis, who was Darius's cousin. Although they were related, they were people apart who granted passage through their lands only to those who paid their price. Even the great kings of Persia had to pay gold in order to pass, perhaps much to their embarrassment. But no army had ever been able to subdue these mountain bandits. So as Alexander approached, messengers from the Uxians greeted him kindly. Owing no allegiance to Darius, they said he could pass to Persepolis as long as he paid tribute. Alexander in reply simply smiled and told them to wait for him in the mountain pass, where they then would receive his payment. Alexander was in no mood to start his march into Persia by submitting to blackmail. He would much prefer to, to teach these Uxians a lesson they'd never forget. Taking several thousand of his best troops, the king led them through a narrow backcountry trail into the mountains led by guides from Susa. There he found several Uxian villages, and one by one he fell upon them at night and killed everyone he could find. He then moved toward the pass where the Uxian warriors guarded the main road. 
He then moved toward the pass where the Uxian warriors guarded the main road. Alexander sent his lieutenant, Craterus, with some skilled mountain troops into the peaks above them, knowing this is where the enemy would retreat to. And with sudden movement, Alexander swept up toward the warriors with such speed that they fled into the surrounding hills, only to find Craterus with his men hiding. Most were cut word that the new king and his army were a terror and a force to reckon with. Alexander simply continued on, destroyed village after village, when Madatis finally pleaded with him to stop. Alexander then did just that, but in turn Madatis would be forced to pay tribute to him with 100 horses each year, along with five times that many transport and how in a matter of days, Alexander straight up f these people up, and it's something the Persians could never do. After that nice little victory, Alexander continued on east toward the Persian gates, the only direct route into Persia. Knowing from scouts that the satrap Ereo Barzanis was awaiting with numerous men at the gates, Alexander knew they'd be difficult to dislodge. Alexander thought over the situation and decided to go for his trademark move of doing the unexpected. He split his army in two, Parmenian with most of the army would head along the long way around to approach Persepolis from the south. Alexander, with a minimal force, would push rapidly through the protected Persian gates. Rapidly through the protected Persian gates. Ario Barzanis, like most others, assumed Alexander would head south along the way. That way, the extra days of the south path could buy Persians time for a better defense or the evacuation of the capital. That's why Alexander did the opposite. He gave up his advantage of more men, all for a risky ploy. Many things, but ordinary is definitely not one of them. So with a few thousand troops, Alexander paced up to the Persian gates, but suddenly, from the ridges above, came raining down arrows, boulders, and javelins. Alexander led his men right into a trap, and with no option forward, he ordered them to retreat. Not being accustomed to defeat, he retreat. Not being accustomed to defeat, he was pretty ashamed and at a loss for words. His rashness just cost the lives of 100 of some of his best men. What would he do now? Would he have to go south as well and follow Parmenian? Well, before he made that decision, he brought forth some prisoners, and under threat of horrific torture, around the Persian gates. One man among them, a Lycian, luckily spoke Greek and informed Alexander that there was a rocky trail that led behind the gates, but it was so narrow, and really only okay to go on in the summer with maybe a few sheep, but definitely not all his men. Alexander, glaring with laser vision intensity, asked the man again, oh. Strangely though, Alexander at that moment thought of a memory from his past. When he was a kid, he had sent a messenger to ask the oracle at Delphi if he would ever conquer Persia. Returning, the messenger said that the oracle prophesied that he would be led into Persia by a wolf. Alexander, staring at this man from Lycia by a wolf. Alexander, staring at this man from Lycia before him, started to make sense of this odd message. He knew the Greek word for wolf was Lykos, practically the same as Lykios or a Lycian. In his mind, it wasn't a coincidence. He told this man that he would cross this sheep path overnight with all his men. And that he would cross this sheep path overnight with all his men. After all, what is impossible for most is pretty much what Alexander does best. So Alexander tells Craterus to stay with most of the infantry and all the cavalry. He was under orders to light as many fires as he could to make it appear that everyone was still camped before the pass, trumpet signaled the charge to the wall. Then Alexander ordered the rest of the men to load provisions for three days and prepare for the toughest climb of their lives. With a whisper of prayer to the gods, Alexander and thousands of his soldiers set off in the night single file, up the trail. Thousands of men risked their lives climbing in the freezing cold in absolute silence and a childhood prophecy of Alexander's. But at last, as a new day approached, they reached the summit of the trail above the Persian gates. Here the men rested and ate while Alexander spoke to his officers. His plan was to split his forces yet again, sending a good amount under Ptolemy directly down the mountainside to strike at the side of the wall. A good amount under Ptolemy directly down the mountainside to strike at the side of the walls at the right moment. Alexander, with the rest of the men, continued down the trail to the back of the pass, which was luckily less hard to climb. When he reached the main road behind the gates, he surprised the Persian guard unit there, killing them all except for a few who fled down the mountain. By now it was. He ordered a trumpet blast that carried on to Craterus at the far side of the gates as the signal to begin part of the attack. At the same time, Ptolemy and his men hit the Persians from the side. Now it was Ario Barzanis who was in a trap. In such a surprise, Alexander slaughtered almost everyone. Only the satrap and a handful escaped. Thousands of Persians defeated. 
Thousands of Persians defending their homeland were hacked apart by ferocious Macedonians and Thracians. Thanks to the Lycian shepherd and Alexander's skill at doing the impossible, the Persian gates had fallen and the road to Persepolis was open. And now it was a race to Persepolis before the Persians could mount a proper defense or evacuate the fence or evacuate the precious treasury that Alexander wanted. Alexander had already sent Philotas ahead on the way to the city and had also just received a letter from Tridates, the royal treasurer, informed that he would hand over the capital and treasury if Alexander would arrive quickly. It was essential that Alexander beat the escaped Ariobarzanes and his men or else they'd have to fight for control then rush toward Persepolis, approaching the great city at the end of January 330. That marked almost four full years after they had left Europe and crossed into Asia. So beating Ariobarzanes there, Tiridates, the treasurer, met God in his word when Alexander came. He opened the gates to the king and surrender, but unlike in Babylon, there were no people bring out of fear of the young king who came from the edge of the world. Making his way through the city, Alexander took possession of the royal terrace overlooking the town. It was here that Alexander felt his men were on edge. The army saw Persepolis as the end-all be-all to the Persian campaign. This place was the embodiment of evil to them. All they wanted to do with them. All they wanted to do was loot and destroy things. So sensing this and not wanting a ride on hand, Alexander gave his army free reign to sack the city, sparing only the palace complex for himself. Pillaging in a city was nothing new, like in Thebes and in Gaza, but this was the first time Alexander let a peacefully surrendered town to be ra surrendered town to be ravaged. So all that day and throughout the night, the soldiers ran wild, killed men, raped women, looted homes, destroyed statues and art, and caused utter hell for the people. Finally, after a full day and night of this, Alexander told his men to stop all the looting, all the killing, and whatnot. But to be honest, by the land, few lives to even spare. Persepolis was nothing but a ruin with a ton of corpses. So after the super pleasant destruction and stuff, Alexander entered the throne room to take his seat on the throne of the great king. Once satisfied, he moved on to the treasury, gazing at all the treasures the Persian Empire had collected from over two centuries. For sure, to all the gold, he made his way to the rural center at Pasargarde, then on to the tomb of Cyrus, which was a small and modest monument. Alexander was actually really impressed with it because it showed humbleness and it gave such a stark difference to the opulence of everything else. Next, knowing Darius was still out there, next, knowing Darius was still out there, or maybe out of boredom, Alexander wanted to leave Persepolis. So when there was word of a tribe and a bunch of other tribal groups in the countryside not recognizing his sovereignty, he quickly used it as an excuse to get away from Persepolis. Leaving his army behind to rest, Alexander took with him his closest companions and a small four companions and a small force of 1,000 cavalry and light infantry into the rugged mountains. Alexander meandered his way through the cold and snow, the rough landscapes, and stretches of land with no farms or people in sight. And over the course of the next month, with this small force, he would find various tribal people and slaughter them all. To Alexander, it was this and his war. He was kind of on a grand hunting expedition. But rather than animals as prey, he hunted humans. Completing this 30-day expedition in the wild, killing for fun, Alexander and his men made their way back to Persepolis. And not long after returning, maybe a few days later, there was a night that would be. And not long after returning, maybe a few days later, there was a night that would be remembered by history forever, as told by Plutarch and many ancient authors. For now, that'll mark part two of Alexander's life. In part three, we'll start off with one hell of a night in Persepolis, then get ready for some traveling with the Macedonians, assassinate usual homicide decision making. Also, comment anything cool you learned so far down below, and if you'd like to subscribe, that'd be pretty great too. Anyways, 